preamble? Uh, yeah, we're recording now, so you can. All right. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and renewed by Governor Maura Haley, this meeting of the Board of Health will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the instructions on the Board of Health posted agenda via Zoom. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public will adequately access proceedings as soon as it is technologically possible. After this meeting, all approved Board of Health minutes are posted on our website once they are approved by the, by the board. I will now open the Board of meeting for April 11 at 5.33 p.m. with a roll call. Pramila? I think you're muted, Pramila. Forgot I was muted. I'm so sorry. Here. Lauren? Yes, sir. And Tim Rendir here. So the Board of Health meeting is has started. Hello, Kiko. Hello, good evening. So we will we will start our agenda with a review and receive session, which is primarily meetings from the March 14th um, uh, minutes. Um, are there any comments, questions, or changes proposed for those meeting, meeting minutes? Neither Lauren nor I were present last month, I think. Yeah, Lauren and Pramila are absent. Um, I'm the only one here present, I think, last. I don't have any edits or comments. Um, uh, so can we make a motion just by just one person or? Risha is not here. Yeah, I'm just texting Risha because I didn't get a message from her that she wasn't attending. So I'm not sure what's happening. Um, but I think technically we have to have a quorum in order to make motions. Isn't that correct? Yeah. So for the minutes, uh, minutes vote, I think I'm the only one here who was present last month. So right. we can actually wait until Risha shows up, you know. Yeah, um, I don't know what's, I don't know. It's not like her not to be in touch. <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going on. Um, and then Premila, you also need to jump off in about 25 minutes, correct? Right, right. So when that happens, if Risha doesn't show, we won't, we will no longer have a quorum. Yeah. My um, video and um, Zoom, in and out as well, so I'm trying to be as present as I can. It's... Hear me. Yeah, we well, can mostly hear you, but you are cutting in and out a little bit. Yeah, my Zoom keeps going out and in, so that might be a problem. Okay. Can we put the approval of the minutes on hold? and go continue on sure yeah let's uh, let's decide on the approval of the minutes for march 14th uh, on hold right now okay so our um, next on the agenda is the public comment is there are anyone in the public who would like to speak we don't have any attendance at the moment so no all right. So now we are at the old business, which is tobacco regulations. Just continuing the discussions from last month. 
Um, I think we could start up the discussions and hopefully Prisha can join us. If not, we cannot any make any final decisions because of the lack of quorum. Um, are there, uh, what, are, what are some of the questions we had which was still pending or at least continuing into this into this meeting from this uh, Board of Health draft. Yeah, so here's the other thing, um, Tim, that's a little complicated is that Risha, so since Maureen is away and Risha and Maureen were the two people who were kind of driving this tobacco regulations revision, Risha had agreed to facilitate this section, as you know, Tim, mm -hmm. of yeah. the meeting and she's not here. So, um, yeah, I think I can try. I have some notes here so I can try to kind of uh, remind everyone of the things that I think are still pending so we can start to have a discussion. And for the the 30 minutes or I guess it's now 22 minutes that we have Premila with us, we're still a quorum. And so that you know discussion can count. But once Premila leaves, if Rishi, if Risha hasn't joined, then I'm since I'm I haven't encountered this situation before, but I don't know that we can have a productive meeting without a quorum. Isn't that what happens? Yeah. We'd have to just adjourn, isn't that right? Uh, not adjourn. Uh, I think we cannot make any decisions. Make any decisions, okay. Like say we can't vote on certain things. So uh, we still can because it's recorded. We can still have the director's report and everything, and then okay. we can adjourn after that. Okay, okay. Um, and I think the goal all along with these tobacco discussions has not so much to make, has not been to make decisions in this meeting just yet but to talk through all of the issues and sort of reach consensus and then have a list of the things that we wanna change, have them written into the regulations and then vote as a group on the revised regulations. So I think we can get around the voting issue anyway on this particular topic anyhow, because we're not there yet. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the decision, I have a question, I'm sorry. So the things that are marked decision, um, decisions are not yet voted on, is that correct? That's right. I mean, the idea yeah. was we got clarity on these things. And so um, Risha and Maureen were sort of tasked with writing that up into a final document, which would then be reviewed in detail with everyone and voted on as a as a board. Yeah. So should we just get to a discussion on number two or? Um, we... Yeah, I think I think the main thing that we wanted to discuss today is about the, the violations. So um, we had decided in the last meeting to stick with the, um, let me see, where are my notes? Um, for the penalty structure for violations. So um, we did decide, we discussed the penalties for state regulation violations at the last meeting, and we agreed to drop the suspension for first violations that didn't involve sales to a minor. So if there was a sale to a minor, there was the $1,000 fee and the seven-day suspension, as is currently written in the regulations. But if it wasn't a sale to a minor, we agreed, you all agreed to drop the seven-day suspension in light of that Braintree, um, the Cumberland Farms lawsuit, I think. Was it in Braintree? Am I remembering that mm -hmm. correctly? Yes. Where that particular item came under scrutiny. So the idea was, let's keep it in sync with the state regulations. Um, so that you all decide, or, you know, there was consensus on, um, but then the question was about the penalty structure for the town regulations, which has lower fines, um, but then there was also an automatic suspension of 7, 14, and 30 days, which seemed, I think, to the group maybe out of step or a bit harsh. So I think that was the conversation that Risha was going to lead the group in, is what about those the penalty structure for the town regulations? violation of the town regulations versus violation of the state regulations. So as of now, the uh, town violations, first violation is $100 and seven day suspension, right? So we had, we thought of um, the seven day suspension is some sort of a harsh, you know, so just leave, uh, keep the $100 uh, fine, is that right? Right. That's, I think, what we, I don't remember exactly that we talked about that as a group, but that is definitely the recommendation that Maureen and Risha were making. Just what you said, Tim. Okay. 
And this was for the second violation, we again uh, retain the fine of $200 and not do the suspension of 14 business days. Correct. I think the recommendation okay. that Maureen and Risha had made was to keep the fine of $200, but to make the um, suspension seven days instead of 14, because it was going to be zero for the first violation and then seven days for the second instead of 14 days. Okay. And for the third violation, it will be 14 days. Correct. I think that's the recommendation that they were making. So I don't know if there's some discussion folks want to have about that, if it seems reasonable. Um, was Sarah, it, was, um, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Lauren. Is there a fine on the third? Mm -hmm. That, that was my question. Is there a fine on the third suspension? Um, for the third violation, currently, there is a fine of $300 and a suspension of 30 days. So what we're proposing is keeping the fine of 300, but changing the suspension to 14 days for the third violation okay. of town regulations. Premila, what were you okay. going to say? Well, I just was curious about, um, you know, what the discussion was in terms of uniformity um, with the state. It just, just listening quickly, it seems like we're, we're lowering fines and suspensions and therefore not um, violations, you know, will be um less i can't think of the word but there's less uh disincentive is what i mean to say and so i was was the general consensus that a thousand dollars was just too high oh that's for the state yeah fine we are talking about the town fine town no no lines. i know i know oh, that oh. but, but uh, you know i don't know if a thousand dollars was even considered uh, oh. Or if, you know, so I just wondered, I'm not advocating a thousand dollar fine, but it does seem overall like we're making um, the restrictions more, uh, more lenient or, you know. Yeah, I mean, so I guess my question would be, since I wasn't, haven't been around for a long time, when these fines were set for the fines for the first, second, and third violation of town regulations, they're lower fines, like you're saying, Premila. For the state, it's a thousand. For the town, it's only a hundred for first violation. So there must have been, it's been like that for some time. So there must and have that, been some discussion about that, right? When so that, is that true for other towns as well? Do you know? I, I don't know. I imagine that when these were set or developed, that it was to be in sync with what other towns are doing. Um, but I wasn't around. I don't, Tim, do you recall? Um, I don't recall, but uh, I, I, you know, I, you guys, you talked about it last time and made some kind of a decision um, as well. So I, I wasn't present. I don't need to belabor the point. I was just asking for more information. Whatever you decided at the last visit is reasonable unless you want to have more discussion about it. Well, I I would just add, because um, I, I do kind of agree with Pamela. Um, I know that, as I said before, you know, math is and and numbers is not my best strength but i know that the town has uh I know they have budget issues um and i know with um cannabis stores that they're supposed to have like certain agreements community impact agreements that. so i just to wonder what is the intentionality behind like, um, 
the penalty, you know, if if it's possible to gain some some other that could be used oh. for the things that the town needs or, you know, programs that the town needs. So that's just, I, I, I don't know. I hope you heard me. Oh, I was just going to say, Lauren, you were breaking up a bit. I mean, I caught some of that. I don't know if others were able to yeah, catch I, the I gist of what... Yeah, I was not I, able to. Yeah. I was not able to. Yeah. Um, so Maybe, Lauren, uh, I, I if, always, if, Lauren, I think I heard you saying something about, um, you know, the importance of fees maybe being available to pay for certain town services. And so questioning whether they should be higher in order to generate more revenue for things. I think that's what you were saying. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. That's a good point. You know, I, mm -hmm. I was looking at Northampton tobacco regulations, they don't have anything for the town violations. They have for the state violations exactly the same numbers. But violations okay. related to the, the town, I don't think, or city, they don't have anything listed there. Oh, okay. So does, does that, that mean, mean... Go ahead, Sorry. Kamala. No, go ahead. They would just follow the state? I mean, is that what's implied? Or not that they don't have any um fees at all for violations right so the town has some specific regulations i think i think for example uh, the number of tobacco tobacco sale permits prohibition of smoking bars and uh, that is very specific to our town and those are the ones i think uh, we have this fine structure are different from the state regulations, which are uh, state uh, primarily defined by the state, you know, uh, regulations and penalties. So these are same, you know, $1,000, $2,000, and 5000 for three violations in, incrementally. But uh, I don't see one in Northampton, but I'm not sure other towns have that yeah, for I town ask, violations. Can I ask a question? Um, so if someone is found to be in violation, do, do they only pay the town violation fee or do they have to pay the state one too? When does the state one get levied? Uh, I will try to answer that. You know, primarily I think the state doesn't um, have penalties for town, uh, town loss. For example, their loss about the number of tobacco sales permits, that type mm -hmm. of things. So, so whenever there is a violation of the state, it's automatically um, those numbers like thousand comes in. But when it comes into prohibition of smoking bars in Amherst, uh, minimum pricing of sale of cigars, which is a town town type of a bylaw, and so town regulations are usually coming under town penalties. So no. when would the state regulations apply? Do you know? Like most it's, towns have governing bodies that decide these things, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the state regulations are governed by the MG, MGL, the Massachusetts General Law uh, within the public health, you know. That's where state laws comes in. Yeah, so the state regulations are things like you can't sell to a minor. That's a sta that's set at the state level. So we have that in our local regulations, but it's a state law. So if people violate that state law, then they, they get the penalties that go with violating a state regulation. Ah, okay. But then, yeah, but then that's Amherst has decided to put in a couple other things that are just specific to the town that other towns don't have. Mm -hmm. So if people violate those things, then they get penalized according to the town fi fine structure. Okay, I understand now, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, I um, think uh, Lauren's uh, point is really well taken, you know, in terms of revenues generated by any type of penalties and how we could use it for other mm. related, you know, uh, programs. And $100 for the first violation is not that much, you know, given the 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, certainly the other fines are are hefty. You know, the thousand dollars is a decent yeah. fine, and and we've levied that. You know, for a number of times over the last several years, um, when people have violated it and sold to a minor, um, so that has generated some some revenue. But to your point, Lauren, I don't actually know where that revenue goes. <laughs> what happens with it? It's a good question for me to follow up on um, in terms of thinking about where those, how those fines are used to pay for programs, because I don't know the answer to that question. But I think, mm -hmm. um, so I will follow up on that, just for my own information, as well as everybody else's. But um, I don't know. So then it sounds like, I think Amherst might be somewhat exceptional in having some town regulations that we are charging people money for violating. I don't know how often that happens. I looked back through my records, and I saw violations of state regulations over the last several years, but I didn't know any violations of our town regulations. So we haven't, as I could see recently, recouped any of these smaller fines for anything. And it sounds like other towns may not even have regulations that are town specific that they fine people for. So it would be good to understand how these fees were set initially when this regulation was written, you know, last written and what that mm -hmm. what information that was based on. Okay. So, so if we can take sense. a Yeah, go ahead, sorry. If we can take a look at the specific um, regulations of the town of Amherst, which, which are listed under uh, seven violations, and then B, five, there's a whole bunch of uh, lists of uh, what violations constitute for the town town uh, laws. Right. So it includes tobacco handler's quiz. And we had discussion about tobacco handler's quiz last time. But I don't know if we decided on that. Uh, but it also has um, uh, violations of any type of a, uh, uh, exceedance of permits or a prohibition of smoking bars that's exclusively um, town oriented or town relevant. Um, so if we can take a look at it and see if they are still relevant, um, if so, I think we should, we can reduce the list. And since we are getting rid of the suspension, I could make a recommendation that we should increase the penalty of the fine, you know? <laughs> Uh, because so we need some sort of an, a, a disincentive, as Pramila was saying, you know, uh, to follow the yeah. to violating the rules. So, do we want to look at that right now? The list, as you just pointed out, that's on page eleven um, under section seven, bullet number five. A through J, those tobacco uh, town specific regulations, are any of those no longer relevant? Well, so we talked about the tobacco handlers quiz, as you said, Tim, but yeah. I think we've, we've now kind of, I think Maureen is rethinking it like, oh, oh maybe we should talk about that some more sure. because, um, you know, it might be something to talk through with Cheryl Savara if we decide to invite her to our next meeting. I think it would be good to have a list of questions to ask her. Because Meredith O'Leary did sort of say that she thought it was a good thing and there are some folks that are doing it with good effect. I think Risha's sort of on the fence. I think it would be good for to have, to have all of us here to talk about that again. Um, but are there other things in this list that folks think so, maybe we should dispense with? I, I'm looking at the first one, the maximum number of tobacco sales permits. That's actually decided by the permitting authorities, right? Why, why why will that become in a violation? Yeah, I think it's a good point. I thought the same thing. And 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 same thing with the prohibition of smoking bars, you know. How would one violate establishing a smoking bar without permit or right? <laughs> I, <Exactly>. right? <laughs> yes, yes. It's it's a mismatch. The the set of violations to these things are these are this is huge. If you actually set up a smoking bar without anybody realizing, or... and we only charge you a hundred dollars for doing that, that, none of that makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, that becomes illegal, you know. So they're yeah. So violating some of the uh, laws, existing laws. Yeah. 
and and minimum pricing on the sale of cigars uh, that is uh, some sort of a giving discounts is that right i'm not sure what that means you know well didn't we talk about that last time um about the oh Risha's oh, here. Risha is here i'm so sorry <laughs> completely lost track of time no worries we're glad to see you Thank you for you joined just in the nick of time because Premla has to drop off and now we'll still have a quorum since you're here. So that's great. <laughs> um, anyway, so Tim, do you want to catch Risha up on what we've talked about so far? Yes. Um, we had been in uh, the violation section. A couple of things we had been discussing is if we get rid of the suspension period for the town violations, um, I think we talked about this last time, I think, last meeting, um, which is $100 for the first violation and then having along with that seven consecutive days of business days of suspension. So I think we thought that suspension is a much more harsher penalty. And one proposal, this just for discussion is to, if you are getting rid of the uh, suspensions, we probably need to increase the penalty which is the fine for each one of those. From $100, you know, a little, little bit more because um, there's, there's, there's no sufficient disincentive for violation, you know, so, so, so that is one of the thing. And then we are, we are also right now discussing about the list of violations which were mentioned in, in that same subsection uh, B5 and uh, which is which includes tobacco handlers quiz as one of the time violations and i think we discussed about whether we need to have it or not but that is something we can we can discuss but i was also saying the other specific things which were listed which might be redundant for example the maximum number of tobacco sale permit allowed in amherst that is decided by the licensing authority you know primarily the person will not illegally open a, a tobacco sales you know, permit or start a tobacco because we have to permit it. You know, someone is permitting. So it becomes very redundant to have that as a violation. The second is also the prohibition of smoking bars. You know? So a violation of establishing a smoking bar illegally, that is something, you know, uh, usually with smoking bar uh, licenses or anything is actually controlled by the licensing authority now so i it may not be a uh, it may not be listed as a violation and so those are three things we discussed um and and i don't know what you think about those lists you know can i just say i have to leave now my apologies i will see you next month okay thank you Prabhu. bye take care bye Yeah. And I just, oh, sorry, Lauren. No, it's okay. I just wanted to ask a question. Is is it more talking about like the illegal setup, like an informal kind of smoking bar? Not illegal, but like informal. Um, do, we, do we even have a definition of smoking bar in here? Let's see. Yes, we do. So an establishment that exclusively occupies an enclosed indoor space, derives revenue from food, alcohol, or other that is incidental to the sale of tobacco. Yeah. Cigar bars, hookah bars are included in that definition. So it's a pretty formal definition of a smoking bar. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and and so Risha, just also to say um, that Maureen had, you know, suggested, or you both had suggested that we adjust the um, suspensions from instead of fra from seven, fourteen, and thirty days for first, second, and third violation of town regulation to zero, seven, and fourteen, which folks generally felt was reasonable. But as Tim said, you know, maybe we want to think about increasing the fines because it's not very punitive. But then the whole question was, what are the actual things that people would be fined for in that category? And this is the list. And it's not really a good match. 
as Tim was saying, um, you know, obviously someone wouldn't be able to, the maximum number of tobacco sales permits is, is set by the licensing. They control that. Somebody couldn't violate that and be fined a hundred dollars. It, it's not, it doesn't make sense. Unless I'm missing something, it seems like an odd list of things for which you would find people these small amounts of money. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And, you know, I don't think that we considered or discussed that. So I think these are all really good points. Um, I, I think on its face, the, the difference was solely what's in the state and what comes under the state mandates and then what's unique and, and sort of more municipality run. And nobody really thought about whether the crime matches the punishment as it were. Um, so I think it's a really good conversation to have and to consider. And, and, uh, uh... Kiko was mentioning uh, that the historically the violations were more focused on the state violations. And we didn't have much of these town violations in the historically, you know, people being pen penalized for some of those list in the list. So, yeah. And, and also, Northampton had, I was just looking at Northampton's, Northampton's uh, tobacco regulations, they don't have any city violations or anything section. Mostly they were all state regulations. I don't know if uh, I'm reading the right one, you know, uh, Rishaki, you can correct me. I, I thought they did, but I don't have it open right now. And so it's probably not a great use of time to for me to try to figure out which is the right one, but I can look at that. Um... Yeah, I mean, I didn't do a comprehensive review, but I did look back because Meredith, since she's the coordinator of the Pioneer Back Valley Tobacco Coalition, occasionally checks in, you know, wanting me to verify her records with what she has as a list of violations. And so over the last two and a half years, there have been several violations and to the state regulations, sales to minors. All of them were sales to minors. And there were fines that were collected and all that stuff. But I didn't see unless the data were, was in a different folder that I didn't look at. Again, not a comprehensive review, but nothing stood out to me in terms of any fees that were levied along the violation of town regulations, you know, those hundred or $200 fines. I didn't see anything like that. Um, so I, I don't know that those, that we're actually levying those fines for violations of the town regulations much. So I think, as you said, Risha, it's something to consider. The other thing I'm just going to add to this conversation while we're all here is that I did get a report at the end of March from the PVTC again that the a representative went out to conduct education, merchant education, and pricing checks in Amherst among our tobacco retailers. And six of the 14 retailers did have, I guess you would call them Technically, they're minor violations in that they didn't have their DOR permits posted, they didn't have their BOH um, permits posted, they didn't have no smoking signs, you know, those kinds of things that they're supposed to have, I guess, per the state regulations. Now, here's why I'd have to, right? You're, you're nodding your head. I'm not as familiar as you are. So then the question would be, should we be fighting them for these kinds of things? Because I don't think we have traditionally. We've only levied those more substantial fines for the sales to minors. And and what what are those fines? Would it be? I guess it would be. I don't it's know. State level, and that's yeah, a thousand your, dollars, right? I mean, required retailer signage is one of the specific penalties for state enforcement. So, yeah. So I mean, and I, we don't have control over what's listed or what the fines are. If I've understood everything correctly, I guess that, and and I don't know what our what we're allowed to do in terms of not levying a fine um it yeah. sounds, should be right i mean i so meredith is on vacation this week i was on vacation when i got this email now she's on vacation so we haven't had a chance to connect because my question would be should we be levying fines are other municipalities doing that because that's pretty significant it's almost half of our retailers yeah. that are not in compliance and and as you said, it feels like a fairly my you know it's it's a piece of paper that's not up um, versus I don't know a a vending machine a cigarette vending machine um, which feels like a much more blatant <laughs> disregard for the the regulations um, and and you know 
that's a thousand dollars for the signage and right now it's a hundred dollars for the vending machine right yeah so is there no prohibition against cigarette vending machines in the state regulations no i, I mean to me it feels like a maybe too specific right that that self-serve, because there's also, a bit, I mean, that's still a, a, a municipality, but those are sort of the same things. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And then there's this weird, and I have to look if there's more of them, but like sales of rolling papers to minors is a $25 fee. Like there's a whole different set of fines for that. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, so yeah, it feels like there's some leveling that needs to be done here in terms of making sure we've got the right we we can't do anything about the state ones as i understand it but that that ours are the right things and and to be honest if we felt like we had two categories within local regulations if we thought that we had minor and major we could set different fine schemes to to address that so if we felt like um I don't know, are any of ours minor? Not really. Pricing on the sale of cigars. If we felt like that was a minor infraction and $100 felt right on that versus, you know, sales of products in, in educational institutions, I don't know. Right. Yeah. So how do we how do we move this forward? Do we do you, would you guys like for a, a small group of us again, sort of you know Maureen and myself, to go and and put our heads together and come up with some suggestions or options, um, and and come back next meeting or or what would be the best way to because it feels like there's a bunch here that we really haven't thought through. I I think it's kind of hard for me to follow. Um, that way, and I have to be honest that I haven't done a lot of you know, things from prior conversations. It seems to me that we like who would follow and go to these places of business and make sure that we. You know, followed and it seemed like we didn't have enough to do that. So I thought that's why we were kind of being more lenient in some ways. But I would like to have. Oh. We're, we're going to be in suspense on what she'd like to have. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking forward to hearing it. <laughs> Um, I do some of that stuff in not really knowing which way to go. I am not able to follow. Um, yeah. Lauren, is it, is it possible to call with your phone for the audio? Uh, I can try. I can try. Good suggestion. Hopefully that okay. will work. So I would suggest that we make a comment about this list today, and then Risha and uh, Maureen can actually work a little bit more on making some suggestions on which we could delete, because it looks like some of them are redundant, but some of them are important. So we can actually have those things which you are proposing to have it in the list. Um, you can, you can, we can discuss in our next meeting. Yeah, and just FYI, um, now that I have everything in front of me, and deepest apologies that I was late, uh, we had removed the educational materials, the quiz um, okay. list in the latest draft, which I think 
I think we haven't shared just because it's still a, a work in progress, but I see it in front of me and it's not there. So, um, so I think the, the question now is on these redundant ones and, and does it make any sense to have them in the list? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then maybe some thoughts with some pros and cons on sort of, you know, how much below state or equal to state fines we would want to be. Um, Lauren, are you back? Yes, I'm here. I'm just to listen. Yeah, it's still cutting out a lot. It's okay. I'll just listen. Oh, no. But we, I think you were talking about how we enforce at a, the local um, uh, regulations, right? And how we even check. Is that is that what? Yes, but I don't, I don't want to say too much because you probably won't be able to hear me. <laughs> we can right hear now. you really we well know. now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I was just saying before we were saying that there's not enough staff to follow up with these, you know, infringements. And um, so I didn't know if that was one of the reasons why we were trying to be a little more lenient. Um, and so I'm kind of getting lost in what our intention, like wh where we and because I, I'm really, it's just not clear to me. Um, and I have to do more studying before the meeting. Yeah. So, you know, Kiko, jump in, or anyone, jump in if I'm off base because I am learning as, as we all go. But my understanding is that the state has the inspectors for this or, you know, there's um, that come in, but they will take our local regulations and check for those as well. Um, and so I don't think we have to, I don't think the reason we're considering changing the fines is because we don't have people who can check the fines. Um, that was an issue with the tobacco quiz in particular, um, whether that was sort of enforceable, but I think there are people who go out, as Kiko just mentioned, she got a report that check um, for for this, right, Kiko? Am I? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, they they are the affiliated with the PVTC, the Tobacco Compliance Officers, and they do these checks. You know, not that frequently. It's maybe a couple times a year. Um, I think in other municipalities, like in Northampton, their inspectors do also do some inspections of, of tobacco retailers in addition to what the PVTC provides. So they're out there a little bit more. We don't really have that capacity so much here. Our inspectors don't do that level of work, but I don't know that it's needed necessarily. Um, I think what we should definitely focus on is as long as the tobacco compliance officers are out there and finding violations, we should be acting on those. And I don't think we have. I, again, I should probably go back and really review to make sure, but it doesn't seem like we have in the past. Sorry, I'm just on mute. Uh, Kiko, you, you're going to go and check whether that's happened and then whether it's a mandatory thing that we need to make sure happens, right? Yes, right, yep. Yeah, because this is all for fun if we don't actually enforce it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think we, we just uh, discussed until the minimum pricing of the sale of cigars. Uh, what do you think of the other items? You know, maybe a quick overview so that Risha can take notes and <laughs> on other others, you know, what what... For example, the sale of blunt wraps, is that something constantly violated or is it something, prohibition of the sale of products, tobacco products in educational institution, that makes sense to keep it, you know. Uh, these are schools and universities, colleges like that. Do college, do the universities have separate enforcement mechanisms? Do we? They have their a board of health, you know, at UMass, right? 
I mean, the health officials. Yeah, they have an environmental from... health department and yeah. they have, you know, university health services. So if there are communicable diseases and whatnot among UMass folks, we don't track those as a health department. They they track it themselves. And if there's a building inspection that needs to happen, it's environmental health at UMass that does it, not our inspectors. Um, so I would think I would think that this would fall under the environmental health umbrella regulation of this sort of thing. Okay. I mean, I think the it's still useful to be there because it, yeah. it would be school. However, it does right. feel like, um, that's not a that we would find that out in different ways than the the inspections, right? Because it's not in a tobacco premise, right? Right. It get reported or something. And, It's fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we should check over this whole list and make sure that A, it still aligns with everything that's been mentioned as a local regulation um, and that we haven't missed any or, or have something there that's no longer in the rest of the document. But I think the second then question is, are breaking of these regulations minor as we are sort of insinuating they are by their fines or are they closer to the level of the state ones mm -hmm. and and there's also other other others in the list which says prohibition of tobacco product vending machines versus to, uh, prohibition of self-service tobacco product displays I don't know, they look like very similar <laughs> uh, display versus vending. Or is that, a, is that something people do in terms of violations? Or I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I get so self service, both vending machines and self service displays have um, definitions in the earlier section and they are separate. I mean, it's just automated versus like, having them out <laughs> on a counter and you take them and leave money. Right. Um, there's there's certainly ways to streamline this, which is you could just define self-service as also including automated, <laughs> not yeah. have to list things doubly, but it, I, it, it holds up in terms of they are mentioned and they are defined. Yeah. And I'm sure there's still an old cigarette vending machine somewhere in town. Yeah. Not, hopefully not being used, but I'm sure it exists. <laughs> and uh, E and uh, H, like, for example, tobacco sales in educational institutions and healthcare institutions, we can always combine them, you know, and saying educational and healthcare institutions. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just about, so I think the the ones in the fines are just perfectly aligned to how we've defined the prohibitions. And so we can combine them in both the prohibitions and the fines, but if we keep them separate in the prohibitions, probably makes sense to call them out separately in the fines. Mm -hmm. And I have very strong opinions on this, uh, you know, um, if we feel like it's fine to to combine them, that sounds reasonable. I, I, I'm I'm thinking more on the implementation side. You know, uh, there are so many in the list, um, and everything is equally weighted in terms of penalties right now. So right, um, right. So you're essentially suggesting kind of a rewrite of this section in terms of what are the regulations that we list here and then what are the corresponding fines for violating those regulations? Yes, um, but that also will become a little complicated. <laughs> so now who will decide, you know, whether it's going to be $100 versus $200 for the first violation and what is the severity of those? You know, that becomes a little more complicated. 
It, it seems like it's worth some research. So, I mean, what I hear you saying is is opportunities to streamline this, um, and I'm sure enforcement people would would appreciate that, right? It's yeah. um, it, it's a little clearer what they have to do, and 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 certainly the the store owners and and workers also the easier it is for someone to remember, the the easier it is for them to adhere to them. Um, so we can definitely look those over. And if you see more, um, we can, we'll, we'll keep looking at those. The fines to me feel like this is a really good space for us to do a little research and see what other municipalities are doing. And if there's any sort of trends in that, um, that make sense, um, that give us a sense of a pro or a con of, you know, the, the kinds of levels of fines that they're doing, because I just don't know. I haven't done that research. So some of the fines are written, I would say, decade old or maybe Probably. more than that. <laughs> so there is inflation. <laughs> you know, when we account for it, it's nothing, you know, dollars is nothing based on yeah. the profits and stuff like that. So I think we have to revisit that type of a change in value of that, you know, money. Uh, but I'm not sure if uh, other towns have updated their penalties. But... Uh, yeah, if we could just review what others are doing and maybe we can come back and readjust ours. All right. Uh, looks like we have a plan for that for the next meeting. Yeah. Uh, so we'll say Richa and Maureen get together and update it. So. We'll make yeah. suggestions or bring arguments, of, you know, the why you might want to go one way or the other at the next meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, next in our agenda is uh, director's update. Okay. Oh, let me ask one question first, which is that um, in terms of inviting Cheryl Sabara back to the meeting, um, are we? Re maybe we're not ready to do that for this next meeting in May. Um, because there's a little more research and whatnot that you want to do. I'm just wondering, because we talked earlier about maybe we do want to have her come to the next meeting, or maybe that's premature. The The only thing for me that feels like it would be really useful to have her is, is this um, Delta whatever conversation where I feel like I just don't have anything to, you know, it'd be useful to have her context. I think at this level, she might just, be able to review what were you know our, our suggested draft and give feedback and then also if we come away from the sort of final conversation on where we're landed with a few things we can't quite you know agree on that maybe that's a, a place to bring her back in but it, I'm not sure we have anything specific to ask her at this point okay unless it's this question and maybe we'll find that out as we research that we need to ask her right <laughs> And as you said, that could be something that you and Maureen could just call her about or email her about. She might be able to answer. So then do we, just thinking about our next meeting, do we want to, because the Delta 8 conversation, I think, is heating up. I think absolutely it would be good to get the rundown from her because she's so knowledgeable. Do we want to try to do that in May as we're also working on this tobacco regulations or is that too much to do in one meeting? I I don't know what else is on. Those two things don't feel too overwhelming. I guess it sort of depends on what else pops up and needs to be addressed at a timely manner. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I said, I feel like the Delta 8 conversation is a little bit time sensitive. Um, so unless we have, you know, a million geothermal wells that we need to approve at the next board meeting, I would vote to, I mean, I would suggest that we try to include that on our um, agenda for next time if it doesn't feel overwhelming. Yeah, and if you feel like that's time sensitive, I mean, we can pause on these regulations too if there's too much else, right? I mean, yeah. there isn't a deadline for this, so. Right, that's a good point. Okay, that's a very good point. Um, and it also depends, I think, on the time that you and Maureen have to do research and work on this in between now and the May meeting. So so we can, you know, keep in touch about that. Yeah, I, I feel like we're getting really close on these uh, tobacco regulations on having it be something to review in writing, that people see a draft, see the changes, remind themselves of, oh yeah, I, I, this sounds right, that we agreed on this, or like, ooh, we didn't talk about this, I, I have questions. Right. Uh, 
versus long conversations. Uh, I think we've hit almost all the points except this last one, which we'll bring back. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Go ahead, Tim. Well, uh, it's director's update. Okay, so um, just the usual sort of standing item things for the director's update. Um, in terms of respiratory illness, I think we're finally exiting the winter respiratory illness season. COVID wastewater levels are definitely on a downward trend and staying low. So we haven't seen any spikes recently. Um, you know, anecdotal reports are that there are lots of colds going around still, but mm -hmm. flu and COVID are re decreasing definitely. So um, we did exhaust our supply of COVID tests. We had so many of them, we gave them all away to people coming here or to community-based organizations. So, and they've all expired by now. So if people still have a cache of them, they, they technically can't be used any longer. We don't have a huge budget to buy more. Um, the CDC is essentially treating, you know, the new, the revised guidance is to treat COVID as any other respiratory illness. And the Mass Department of Public Health has also reinforced that guidance and given that to the local health jurisdictions to, you know, work, work with. Um, but there is some value, I think, according at least to Mass DPH and people knowing whether they have COVID or flu. So being able to have a provider test someone for COVID or flu, because in some cases there would be treatment indicated for those things in a way that there wouldn't if you just had a common cold. So I there could be some value in us having COVID tests in the future. We're going to kind of see what happens and what if the state provides more free ones or if we have some budget spending or leftover money we need to spend in, by the end of the year, that might be a, a good budget item. But at this point, we don't have any. And people still come by, right, Kyle? Still come by the office asking for them because they are definitely very popular. Um, so that's sort of the update there. Um, the kindness campaign, um, this is the last month of the campaign, although we're really thinking about trying to keep the spirit alive. Um, on that note, Lauren, um, who I guess really has dropped off, which is too bad, maybe she'll pop back on before the end of the meeting, but she has been communicating or working, collaborating with me and um, Becky from the Recreation Department on setting up some more mental wellness um, sessions specifically for adolescents in the month of May. So May is actually Mental Wellness Awareness Month, I think, or Mental Health Awareness Month. And we're really excited. We're collaborating with the um, Youth Mental Health Collaborative, I think it's called, out of Springfield. They have some great trainers to do two sessions in May for high school students. Um, I can definitely get those flyers out to you all. I haven't shared those with you yet, Kyle. Um, but because they're sort of outside of the kindness campaign, which is supposed to end at the end of April, but we're, you know, it's still this theme that we're kind of working on. And one of them is a spoken word um, workshop. It's called, I said what I said, I meant what I wrote, and really kind of encouraging young people to express themselves and their emotions through the written word or spoken word. So that's, we're really excited about hoping to get a lot of young people to come to those. Um, the other mental wellness workshops that we've done through the kindness campaign have not been that well attended. Um, I had a feeling this might happen. It's just some of them have focused specifically on suicide prevention, which we know is an issue in, in our community and nationally that suicide rates are going up, but it's a hard thing for people to talk about. And what we learned at the session last night, which was attended by only one person other than our staff from the trainer was that oftentimes when she does these sessions, it's in response to something that's happened. A young person has you know, died by suicide or some family member has had a relative who died by suicide and wants to learn more, wants to spread the word. And that's when you get people to show up for these things. Um, just out of the blue, it's not it's not meeting people's needs. So we did have more attendees at the mindfulness session that um, Shalini Milne um, conducted. That was at the end of March and there were more people who came for that. And Heather or Hala Heather Lord is doing one in April, which is for families. And I think we might get some more attendance there, but we're learning a lot about this, how to do this and still trying to just spread the word about how being kind and reduces stress and stress is a big public health concern. So how can we keep spreading the word about that? Um, we had a successful hepatitis A vaccine clinic at Craig's Doors. We vaccinated 11 guests and three staff. And at first, we didn't know that we would have much interest at all. But people kind of talked to each other at the shelter. And there was a lot of peer to peer encouragement. Even that evening, people were kind of convincing each other to get vaccinated. So it was actually a really lovely, fun, feel good kind of event. So that felt great. And we want to be able to do more 
um, hepatitis A vaccine with that population in other ways. So we're continuing to collaborate with Craig Stores on that. Um, I don't really have much to say about National Public Health Week, which was the first week in April. It's sometimes hard to come up with things to do to celebrate that. Uh, I think Northampton had a lot of events like car safety um, education evenings and uh, um, vaccine clinics, um, but we just kind of put the word out about it and tried to remind people that we're still here in public health and we're still doing our work. So maybe next year we could plan something. I think it's something we have to think about more ahead of time, and maybe that would be a good Board of Health, Public Health Department collaborative activity to plan something for National Public Health Week to, again, kind of raise our visibility as public health. People do forget the important work that we do when there's not a pandemic raging, so it's always good to remind people about why we're here. Um, and on that note, our public health nurse, Olivia, has been doing office hours at the Bangs. Um, she's the second Wednesday of the month. So uh, we actually had a lot of interest before it officially got going. Some people were knocking on her door last month. It was really supposed to start this month. Um, but so she has seen a couple of people. And it's just nice for her to be able to offer blood pressure screenings and health education. She's in the bubble room, which is on the ground floor of um, the bank center and has had a couple of not huge volume, but I think it will will um, it'll take off with time. Um, it's great for people to have time with the public health nurse just to talk about whatever is of concern to them. So we're happy about that. Um, I, those are the main things that were on my list. I did want to mention that we we get these infectious disease reports every month through the MAVEN database and also through our collaboration with the Public Health Excellence Grant that's run by the city of Northampton. So I could add this as a standing agenda item, you know, our infectious disease reports. I think it's probably not that interesting to drill through the whole list of things, like how many TB cases this month? Probably not that interesting, but if there's something that's kind of standing out, I might bring it up. And one thing that is standing out is that we are already seeing cases of tick-borne disease, some Lyme and anaplasmosis, um, and it's really early in the season. So we're gearing up for what is going to be probably a prolific tick and mosquito season with all this lovely rain that we've had. And if it starts to get hot at some point, it's just the perfect prescription for lots of bugs reproducing. So, um, yeah, we're just going to keep an eye on that. Um, I think you've also heard about avian flu kind of being out there um, and some cases that it has there was one human case. Um, in Texas. So Mass Department of Health is just kind of on the alert. No, nothing is happening. We don't have any, it was, avian flu was found in dairy cows in Texas and that the person who got infected got it from a cow. No cases of dairy cows in Massachusetts with avian flu. Um, so we're just on aware of it, but nothing, we're not doing anything right now except just keeping an eye out and listening to whatever the Mass Department of Public Health has to say about it. So also, no measles cases in Massachusetts right now, thankfully. Hopefully, it stays that way. I don't think I have anything else. Any questions, comments? Um, the, the conversation around the infectious disease report, is there anything akin to that for non-infectious? I mean, is there sort of a... Um, morbidity mortality you know like we we don't have a lot of deaths so we aren't going to have like a, a death report but uh, of you know injuries harm things that detract from life quality is there anything that sort of combines infectious and non-infectious mm -hmm. gives us a sense of where the trends are or where the, the greatest need is? Yeah, I think we don't have those kind of data at the hyper local level. I mean, because we are charged with tracking infectious disease at the local municipal level, we get all the all the reportable diseases we have in our town wide database. But for some of those other things, it would be more like the state puts out reports that are maybe county wide or statewide. Um, so we can look at trends that are more general, but not so specific to AMR so much that I'm aware of. And then the, is there a Hampshire County public health that then is mandated to look at that? Well, there aren't county health departments, so there isn't a county entity. I mean, I think the, the Public yes. Health Excellent Grant does try to, because they have the town-wide reports, you know, the, for infectious disease for 16 communities in Hampshire County, they can kind of look at a county-wide trend for those infectious diseases. But in terms of these other things, I don't know who's collecting those data and how 
I mean, I think the state probably has some that, like, for example, hospitalization data, I go on the mass DPH site and I can see in Hampshire County how many hospitalizations there have been. Um, but other sorts of data, I'm not really tracking that closely. Do you have a specific thing that you're thinking about? Just general. No, I was just thinking, you know, if if we if we're doing if, if we're trying to think of where to invest and we're we're talking about you know these various things like how does how does the harm or potential harm from a hep a compare to road accidents or you know yeah. completely other things and i don't have any sense of that so i was wondering if there's a place to look <laughs> to... yeah yeah i mean those if we had county health departments those kind of data would be tracked at the county health department level and because the locals are often so small like maybe in boston they can track that stuff better but i don't think we have an infrastructure here to do that um, for things like overdose deaths, those kinds of data are collected by the state at the zip code level. So we know kind of roughly what's happening with that in Amherst, but we don't collect it ourselves. So for some of these other things, if there's not a state mechanism in place to collect them, then we don't really have access to that info. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. So just still learning the... <laughs> no, it's a good question. I'm also still learning. So I my, my answer might not be 100% accurate, but I'll, I'll also keep this in mind as something to think about too because it helps in, in terms of understanding what our public health issues are in the town and how we should be addressing them. We need to know what they are before we can address them. Thanks for that question. Um, one thing I thought about though, before we adjourn, which is uh, Premila made me aware that this meeting was meeting time was changed to 5.30 from five o'clock to accommodate her schedule. And today was an anomaly for her, she, but she normally does not have to work on Thursday nights. So she said the meeting could go back to five o'clock if that's something that people want. Now we only have two folks, two board members on the call right now, but I just wanted to put that out there as something that, would that work for you both, Risha and Tim, to start at five instead of 5.30? Yeah, it's fine with me. Yeah, me too. Five o'clock, yeah. Two, okay. Okay, so maybe we can um, chat with Maureen about that when she gets back. Let's see if we want to change the time. And Lauren, I don't know. And Lauren, Lauren. yes. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank um, you. One more thing is, uh, uh, is there a is there a way to arrange a hotspot or something for Lauren? You know, for some sort of a borrow for that month, or uh, no, each month. You know, for during the meeting, I think it will help communications. You know, really about it. So. Because I think the signal signal is being lost, you know. Um, yeah. And we want everyone to participate. That's the I main thing. I know. I so appreciate you saying that. Do you know, Tim, is that something that had been suggested before? It sounds like yes. it may have been suggested before. I suggested right? a couple of times before. Okay. Yeah. And did uh, Jen it, did Jen try to make that happen or do you know? No. No, it was not. Okay. I, I think it it's not that, that expensive. I think if uh, even the Board of Health can get one, you know. If they could right and, uh, to use for various things right exactly yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, okay thank you good suggestion thanks i feel like does the library have them i feel like i've seen some place that gives them out or has them um and i wonder if we could be a facilitator of getting yeah getting that for because I, I think expanding access is really important, right? It mm -hmm. might be Lauren now, but it could be anybody that we want to participate in the future. So that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind, I that, but I was just remembering that I've seen them somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can look into that for sure. Yeah. yeah. I remember, um, I know libraries is one option. Schools might also lend uh, hard spots, you know, right? They lend the laptops, but I'm not sure about hotspots. No. Yeah, I, and there may be resources. And I also like the idea of it being something that we that we have for ourselves, for the Board of Health, for public health, because I think we could use it for a number of yeah. reasons. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, especially when we are having clinics or anything, wherever you want to have a Wi-Fi connection, you know, it will be wonderful right. to have one. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, one, one question related to director's update. I know we are potentially going to have a um, larger tick and mosquito uh, type of a season. I'm just curious, I think we've subscribed to 
Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control, I think, surveys. District, yes. District, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I'm just curious, you know, I, I think uh, if they will be actually more providing us more frequent information um, uh, on on the you know, any potential cases or what is the risk involved in this, you know, I, I'm just curious about that. So. Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that. So they will be doing, they did fairly comprehensive surveillance starting last year. And they'll start doing that in, in early summer. They're also going to do, we've had some, I've made a budget request to pay for some treatment as well. So there, because there was a, a, a West Nile positive pool in September in North Amherst last year. And so they know that there was West Nile in that area of town. So the plan is to begin treating that pool with briquettes, you know, that, that kill the larvae in early summer in that area. So we knew that there was West Nile there last year. Let's get ahead of the game by treating it early in the season. So that's plan number one. And then the surveillance will continue throughout the summer. And if there is more prevalence, then there could be possibilities of more intervention down the road if needed. Um, but yes, we're doing treatment for the first time um, this year based on what happened last year. Would there be an interest, and I, I say this for myself personally, I would be interested in um, learning more about what we can do at the household level to you know, prevent or um, or treat in ways that is, you know, both approved and safe and all of those yeah. things? Yeah, I know. I mean, Kyle, we've certainly done a lot of education about mosquito-borne illness as the season ramps up. And there's, you know, all the traditional things like make sure you have screens in your windows, no standing water, wear repellent, long sleeves, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, but if there are, in terms of treatment, it might be actually good to give education to some people because there are those companies out there that do mosquito spraying and some people feel like maybe that's the way to go. I think there's mixed feelings about whether that is the way to go. Um, it can be expensive. How toxic is it? These are all questions that people probably have. And I don't know if we have developed education material about that sort of thing. It might be worthwhile to do that. Yeah, that could be something maybe we take on as a as a one pager that we put on the website. And 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 I when I say we, I don't know who I'm talking about necessarily, but um, you know, whether that's the board or the department or um, but it, it feels like, you know, maybe we don't need to do big sessions, but that is kind of what I was talking about is there's always these signs for different sprayers or treatments. And, you know, as a as a resident, I don't really know what is in those things or what is the latest um, recommendation. So maybe just a, the, the personal, I, I agree, has gotten out pretty well. Yeah. Um, but more at the household level or the business. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, so John Briggs, who is the sort of director of the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, he's super knowledgeable. And when I first met him, he did talk to me somewhat about these companies. Um, and I think he we could pick his brain and come up with, do develop a really nice one pager about this that we could put on the website along with the general, you know, education about what to do. Because um, those signs are very compelling. I remember when I first moved here, I saw them everywhere. <laughs> so, Yeah. Yeah, and they probably have one, right? I mean, this isn't d different town to town, so. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, we don't have any topics uh, not anticipated in recent days, so it's time to adjourn. So I will make a motion to adjourn uh, the April meeting of the Board of Health. I think I'm the only one who can second it. So exactly. <laughs> Uh, all in favor? <laughs> <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Risha. Aye. All right. Uh, meeting adjourned. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone. Thank Have you. a good evening. Bye. Bye.